And welcome to AMD Prefetch Attack Through Power and Time. This work has been a collaboration with Daniel Cruz and Michael Schwarz. And in the next 12 minutes, we will talk a bit about prefetch instructions, what makes them special, what side channel information can leak from that. We will have case studies exploiting this behavior in real world scenarios, and then we will discuss mitigations. So a prefetch software instruction is a hint that allows the CPU to move data closer to the CPU for future usage. And the interesting property is on the one hand that it can be ignored by the CPU. So the CPU is not necessarily required to execute this instruction. Another interesting property is that it does not throw any exception. And you pass an address as an argument to the instruction and the in instruction internally needs to translate this virtual address to a physical address. And on modern processors, this is done with so-called page tables, where you have different levels that give you the meta information, allowing to translate this virtual address to the physical one. And intuitively, depending on the mapped level that is used, the translation will take either longer or shorter. In addition, for subsequent accesses, a CPU has a translation look-aside buffer that can cache those translations. So it must not do this all the time. And if you now measure the execution time to such an instruction, you have a side channel information that we described some years ago to break KSLR on Intel CPUs. However, with the discovery of Meltdown, stronger page table isolation has been applied as a software mitigation against, on the one hand, meltdown attacks and also against the prefetch side channel attacks that have been presented back then. And AMD is believed not to be vulnerable against these attacks. So KPDI is not active on AMD. And in our work, we want to revisit that assumption and see what type of information we can leak using prefetch on AMD CPUs. In order to investigate the leakage, we need some primitives that allow us to observe what is happening inside the CPU, and then we will see what type of leakage we can observe. On the one hand, we need a high-resolution timer, and the update interval of the unprivileged RDDSC instruction is typical around 20 to 40 cycles on AMD microarchitectures. While this is sufficient for cache attacks, in order to observe smaller differences, we need a different timing primitive. The good thing is, with the Zen 2 microarchitecture, the RDPAU instruction has been introduced, and it gives us unprivileged access from user space to the APERF and MPERF MSR. So we have a new high-resolution timing primitive that we can use on modern AMD microarchitectures. On the other hand, with family 17H, an interface that can be compared to the Intel REPL interface has been introduced to AMD microarchitectures. And it gives you the ability to obtain the power consumption per individual core, which is a bit different than on Intel CPUs. And with Linux 5.8, this interface is also available to unprivileged users, so you can mount software-based power side channel attacks. But what is actually leaking from the prefetch instruction? On the one hand, you can leak information about the page table level of a certain address. In the end, you observe how many levels the page table walker has to translate in order to find the corresponding physical address. And the interesting thing is the observation is the inverse to an Intel CPUs because Intel obtains page translation caches that allow to speed up the translation process as well. On the other hand, an interesting property that we found is that on Zen CPUs, you have two page table walks to inaccessible addresses, for instance, kernel addresses. But on Zen 2 and onward microarchitectures, even invalid translations are stored in the TLB. And this is not happening on Intel, for instance. Furthermore, what we can leak is whether an address is cached in DLB or not. So we can now mount accesses that have previously demonstrated also only on Intel CPUs by using the prefetch instruction as a primitive. We can also investigate the influence of different memory types, whether an address is uncacheable or not, for instance, or other page table entry properties. And I invite you to look at the paper for those details. With this leakage, we can now build free attack 
primitives, prefetch and time, for instance, or prefetch and power, where we use the power side channel information when we don't have access to a high resolution timer. For Zen 2, we need to tackle things a bit differently. So we have TLB evict plus prefetch in order to work around this behavior on Zen 2. But what can we attack with this? Let's look at some case studies. For instance, many exploits rely on the knowledge of memory locations of certain functions. And this is with ASLR, we have a statistical mitigation for memory corruption vulnerabilities. And we also have that in the kernel as kernel address space layout randomization, where on every boot, we randomize the exact location of the kernel and the drivers within a certain area in memory. Using our prefetch side channel now, we can de-randomize the exact location, as we can see on the top by using time, or at the lower part, using the energy consumption. And now we can successfully figure out the exact address of this function. However, a modern version of KSLR, dubbed fine-grained KSLR, is still randomizing the image, but also shuffles the functions within the kernel image. So just finding where the image is located doesn't give you the actual address of the function anymore. And this shuffling is also done once at boot. We use activity template attacks where we first reset the state of the DLB by evicting it, and then using a trigger, an event that accesses or executes the targeted address that we want to find. Then we just measure the prefetch instruction for all the candidates. And as you can see here in this figure, there's one peak to the lower part that actually corresponds to the actual address that we try to find and therefore allows us to break fine-grained KSLR as well. However, the same principle can be applied to many other things because now we can monitor certain addresses that correspond to certain events. And using TLB, evict, and prefetch, we can basically observe any accesses from the kernel. And here in this use case, what we did, we detected whenever the Bluetooth audio module played audio to the headphones, and we can easily see in the middle part when audio is played and when not. In addition, you can use this side channel also in a specter scenario, because during transient execution, the kernel accesses an address based on a secret. And this address will be loaded into the cache and the translation will be stored in the TLB. Most spectre types attacks, or at least the one that have been shown most of the time, require shared memory between the kernel and the user space. So this is another requirement for the gadget that one can exploit. And with our TLB evict and prefetch primitive, we can detect if a page translation of the kernel, which we otherwise could not access, is stored in the TLB. Imagine you have a kernel module with this Spectre PhD gadget, and in contrast to other gadgets, in that case, we only need to require the variable offset, but we don't need any control over the lookup table. If we now mount this attack, we can leak the secret string byte by byte that is accessed within the Linux kernel transiently. The question now is, what can you do against those attacks? In the beginning, I said that KPTI is deployed on Intel CPUs or Melton affected CPUs. And what it basically does is it removes all the kernel mappings when running in user mode. And if we deploy this patch, our KSLR break and all the other attacks that we presented is not working anymore. There's another kernel implementation mitigation that instead of removing the kernel mappings, inserts dummy mappings when running in user mode, and it's called Flare. And it also mitigates the KSLR break, but the other attacks, like on the Bluetooth module, are still working. We also evaluated that, and as you can see, the KSLR break does not work anymore. We also proposed to introduce configuration MSRs that will translate prefetch instructions to knob operations, so they do not do anything anymore. And we later figured out that these already exist, but are hardly documented in a very old PDF. In concurrent work, we also automatically reverse engineered them and found them. So using this MSR, 
you can just disable the prefetch functionality for all the different prefetch instructions that exist. To tackle the power side channel, obviously what you can do is you can restrict the unprivileged access to that interface. And this is what AMD actually did. However, in a more frequent Linux kernel, they fully removed the driver in response to this paper and also the Platypus paper, because there is apparently no need that you can access that. To conclude the work, what we've seen is that prefetch side channels undermine the isolation between user space and kernel space, also on AMD CPUs, and this issue has been tracked under the CV number. We presented three exploit primitives, a new timer that you can use on Send 2 and Send 3, and we demonstrated the applicability in real-world scenarios. We discussed and evaluated the mitigations, but we invite you to read the paper because there are more details and more experiments that I could not cover in this talk. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask or just come and talk to us afterwards. Thank you.